or not. Just a little bit more to go. So, how amazing is it to have the freedom to come to the house of God and just to allow the Spirit to move us. And to just know that we're led by spiritual men and women who aren't trying to conform and put Jesus into a box and are afraid to encounter the new the Holy Spirit. But they're more interested in your well-being than in the performance and the schedule that we think that we should follow. Amen. So it is a really, really, really good day. Um, it's just amazing when we just get to see the things of God just flow in such unity. We were in the prayer room. It's like I don't need to preach, like we could have just brought that conversation, put it down in the video, and we all would have heard what it is. We all should already make it for Christmas time. Um, so this morning I want to share something with you, and it's quite funny that um, Pastor Kirk would have done that altar call and would have addressed the spirit of fear right from the beginning. And he said something quite significant because his point is getting into the word we haven't dealt with that first. And just as he said that, that was exactly what I was feeling, is that you kind of have a look at the, at the order of service and thinking about where are we going to go now, how is this all going to work out? But God is the God who knows absolutely what we are. There is nothing that we need to fear when we just know that we're walking and we're moving together with them. And I want to share a, a scripture with you today out of Exodus 3. Um, for many of us who have grown up in church circles and Sunday school, we know the story of Moses, we know the story of the burning bush. And when we tend to read that, we tend to have a look at the amazing wonder that took place. And I think in church life, we spent a lot of time wanting and desiring the signs, wonders, and miracles of God, and perhaps we actually tend to miss some of the key points of Scripture. We have just started doing a ladies' Bible study, and it's about Jesus and women through Middle Eastern lens. And it has just been, just in week one, just the shift that takes place, because the way that we tend to read things is, what does this tell me about me? Whereas when the Middle Eastern people, when they read the word, they say, what does this teach me about God? Because how many of you know that if you look at yourself for too long, you're going to become a little bit depressed? Because you don't measure up. Yeah. You're always going to find something to be fearful for. You're always going to be something to be, find something to be intimidated by. There is always going to be a reason why you can't come into a service, have an incredible encounter with God, and by the time you get your car, you've already got yes, but, 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 I'd rather be fine. Or we see an incredible dedication, we think, oh wow, hey, this is incredible little girl, she's going to walk out there, she's going to change the world. And then we start to see, like she talks about this creativity and a little bit of a difference in, in how she just expresses herself, and oh my goodness, I'll be against what God is doing, and he's tend to come into a box. And this morning, this deliverance, there was one of the words that came out of the prayer room, was that this morning is about deliverance, and I don't think that we're done yet. Because there is a lot of self-deliverance that we need to take care of. And by that, if you're wanting to start like itching and run out the door, please don't. I'm not about to start shaking and screaming and watching you all go crazy. God is a God of order. And He desires nothing more than to get Egypt out of you so that you can walk in the promised land. And there is something that we need to do in order to partner together with Him. So bear in mind how we will tend to now change the way that we read the word out of Exodus 3. Moses has found himself out in the desert. He's having a look after the, the sheep. He's run away because I don't know if you all know the story, but he had committed murder. First of all, he started off his life by being given away. He should have been dead. Yeah. But the call of God on his life. He ends up being raised in the house of Pharaoh. After that, he ends up killing somebody. He runs away thinking that this is just the heaven to kick him. But God. Yeah. So if you guys think that you've got a couple of reasons to exclude yourself, just take a moment and think, okay, well, if God could do this for Moses, why would he do this for Moses? So in Exodus 3, The Lord says, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt, and I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out into the land, into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached 
me, and I have seen the way that the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I'm sending you Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, don't you just love this man boldness that you dare to have a conversation back and say, but who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? What I said to Moses, I am who I am. That would be what we know to be joy. This is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. And God said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. In all of that, it wasn't so that Moses could look good. You don't get saved so you can look good. You don't get saved so that you can just have a get out of hell free heart. You respond to the call of God in your life when you say, yes, Jesus, I give you my all. I want to get rid of the fear. I want to get rid of the intimidation. Because there is something more, because there is a sending that he does on you. You see, at this time, the, the Israelites had been held captive in Egypt for 430 odd years. For 400 odd years. But the Israelites are a culture of remembrance. So they would have remembered. They would, I mean, here we sit with so many generations who have taught us what it looks like to be a believer. And likewise, can you imagine for 400 years to carry the story of the goodness of God, to carry the story of the deliverance of God, to carry the story of God doing the impossible so well that they would dare to stir up a hope inside of them that God can do this again for them. And God reaches out and he says, I've seen your cry, I've heard your cry, I've seen your pain, I've seen how you've been ill-treated, and I'm coming to rescue you. And he sends and he calls Moses to do the bidding for him. I want us then to fast forward to the New Testament. And in the New Testament, when we end off in Malachi, which is the last book in the Old Testament, and when we get to Matthew, the first book in the New Testament, there is a 400 year period that we don't really speak about very much. It is known as the intertestamental time. It is a time that some refer to as the time that would be the quiet years where there was no significant writing of any great prophet that had been taking place. But God, these people of remembrance, this, this culture of community and remembering, had remembered the promises and the beauty of God. They had remembered that it had been written in Malachi 4 that the Son of Righteousness, He will come with healing in His wings and He will once again meet with healing. There was a hope and there was a promise that once again was deep down inside of them, but when it started to stir and it came to the surface, they knew that they could hold on to it because they had seen Him or they had heard Him do it before. And they believed that He could do it again. Jesus continues. I love this one woman, she says that she believes that the 400 years of silence is not that God wasn't doing anything, he was busy preparing the nursery for Jesus to be born. So we don't need the Moses, because that's not going to cut. So who do we get? Who does Jesus come to come and set for me? You and I. He's the answer. Here's the same message. We could speak about Jesus every single Sunday and just the salvation message. We sing that song that He is our Redeemer. That He is our redemption. That He's the one who's come and He's done it all. That God steps in and He brings us the Christ, the Messiah. Why? Because He's heard your cry and He knows that there is nothing that you can do to restore you to a relationship with Him. He has seen the oppression of the enemy. He has seen the lies that you've been listening to. He's seen the culture that you've adopted that is anything but his desire for you. And he brings you the answer. Yeah. He brings you the answer. The one who's able to turn it all around for you. And my question to us today is not about do you recognize that Jesus is the answer? 
But what are you doing with Jesus, you ask? Because it's one thing to say that we believe in God. There's a distance involved in that. It's another thing to say that I believe God. On the inside of me, that there is something that even when it is hopeless, there is still hope. Even when there is chaos and sadness around me, there is still a deep-seated sense of shalom. There is still a deep-seated sense of joy inside of me because I know. Do I look like a peculiar and a different person because there is something inside of me that won't buckle under the oppression of society today? Do I carry this hope? We get so intimidated and so fearful that Pastor Kurt will stand up at the end and say, all of those who came forward for prayer, when you leave here today, I want you to speak to two people and just tell them about the goodness and the goodness of God. You will start finding the good excuses. So going back to our friend Moses, he led a nation out of Egypt. Not two people, not a group of 200 people, it's recorded that there were about 600,000 men, excluding women and children. I think he had reason to question his ability to go and stand in front of Pharaoh to carry out the will of God. That is a lot of people. What if we approach the enemy with that kind of backing? What if we come and we stand and we go, but I have been sent by the king. Not a distant one, but one who lives in me, and I live through him. How different would your approach be? And is it different? Because again, it's easy to have this kind of conversation, and it's easy to have this kind of thinking that yes, I will do these things, but will you do these things? Will you do these things? Will you allow yourself to be changed and transformed into the likeness of Christ Jesus? Because when God was looking at the people and he saw their pain, God is still looking at the people and seeing their pain. And guess what? You and I are the answer. The question is, will we come in and participate? Moses needed Aaron to come in and speak for him because he just thought that his suffering was going to make it easy. We have given the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the very breath, the very presence, the very Spirit of God Almighty, the living God, Yahweh, we get to carry this incredible privilege and yet we find that we are intimidated and we are afraid when we think that we need to step out and do something or say something to Jesus. Where is our focus? Where is our focus? Do we spend so much time staring at our own life that we only catch a glimpse of God? Should we not shift that? That we spend so much time staring at God that we catch a glimpse of ourselves and we're such a minor in comparison that we will keep pushing on because even in my mess we can turn it into an amazing message. He is able. Do we have that kind of tenacity inside of us? And to God to testify just of how life can look the one way and God just comes in and does something else. But she's always stood strong. She's always stood strong. There's a culture of remembrance of the goodness of God. There's a culture of remembering how good God has been and where He's brought you from. We sang that song earlier, which is probably one of my favorites, Amazing Grace. Because honestly, if you can sing that and remember where you were and where you are today, you might not be where you want to be. You might still want to do a whole lot of new things. You might still want to just go out and just take a chance and be, take a risk and do something different. But you're not where you were. And if you are, why? What keeps you going back to Egypt? What keeps you going back to your place of bondage? How many services have you attended where you've had an incredible touch of God and you've gone out and then you find yourself back again in six weeks' time and there's another old school and you've got to come running back again and you go, God, I just messed this up again. What keeps you going back there? When will we shift our focus and realize how mighty and, and, and incredibly present the presence of God is in our lives? When will we stop looking for a burning bush for somebody else to come and to tell us that we're okay and simply listen and believe in the word of God? Is it possible that we're so governed by our feelings that we don't lean on what we know? Yeah. If you're going to be 
governed by a feeling you're going to go round and round and round. And believe me, it was not pleasant. You can ask the Israelites one day who did the wandering in the desert. It was awful. But God, would we have a different spirit like Caleb? Go, but there is something we are able. The enemy looks big, but we know a God who is even bigger. Are we able to step in and to do that? And in about this time, we start to think, okay, where can I serve? Where can I go? They're asking for more volunteers in the Sunday school. They need somebody to step in and do this. If I can get into the worship team. It's not about where you can work. It's about where you can serve. Yeah. The greatest leaders are those who can serve. If we ever think we're greater than Jesus, we've got a big problem. And Jesus was the ultimate one who just displayed what it looks like to serve. In the Great Commission, he says, in Mark 16, he says, Then the disciples went out and they preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs and accompanied it. We received the same ability to serve. We receive the Holy Spirit who desires to serve. And what does it look like to serve? How many people around you do you see going through a hard time? How many people do you just know in your work environment or even in your family who you just look like they're really going to attack all this cash? How many people are facing death and despair? How many people are facing financial burden? How many people are crying out for children? How many people are trying to restore marriages? How many people are just overwhelmed by depression and anxiety? How many people just can't see the light at the end of the tunnel? Is it possible that when you just simply draw alongside of them and go, I'm here, let me tell you about the goodness of God. And perhaps you don't even need to act your word, but just simply draw alongside of them and just be there. Be that refreshing. Be that moment where they can just find that they can breathe and they can realize that they're not alone. The Israelites moved in great favor. They moved in great strength because they were together. Should we not be alongside of one another? Should we not be able to do much more because of who is with us and in us? We're called to be his hands and feet. We're called to be his voice. So when we leave here today, perhaps we could do a little bit of introspection and go, what is my hands and feet busy? What do I lend my voice to? Where am I coming into agreement? Am I coming into agreement with the leading for the impossible, or am I just being negative? like so many others? Am I coming into agreements that when something has ended, instead of being able to prophesy life, if Ezekiel could prophesy to the dry bones and see the rise of the army, should we not too be able to prophesy into wilderness environments and see them come to life? How great a testimony to be able to bump into somebody 10 years after you just been able to spend five minutes with them and for them to turn around and say, Tim, you remember when we had coffee that day? I need to tell you that this is what happened in the last 10 years. We don't need to be the same because we're not. We simply need to represent him well. And I wonder how well we represent him. And I don't just, I'm not speaking to you, I'm speaking to me. Every single day we have the opportunity to represent him in a way that just shines his light for the world to see. Believe it or not, I saw something good in a taxi yesterday. As he drove past me, he had a stick on the back. He says, Don't get the pain of your past paralyzed or present. I was like, Wow, that just went in the taxi. I'm like, How is that? But don't let the pain of your past paralyze or your present and I'll add up all your future. If you're sitting here this morning and perhaps you, you, you came up or perhaps you didn't come up and you're still going, yes, but I'm not being all that I think that I should be. It's like, oh, God, where am I backing? Where am I believing you? Where am I not trusting you? What do I need to do that would be different? Where am I able just to believe you? And where am I perhaps just believing, believing in you at a distance? Yeah. 
Wherever you focus, that's where you're going to move towards. So if you're focusing on his power, his authority, and his presence, you're going to move on. If you're focusing on your own inability, on your own fear, on your own failure, on your own past, it's going to keep you stuck and paralyzed. We are called to live to what you must have done. We're called to live like rivers and not as lakes. You did not even come up this morning for prayer. You did not come to church this morning just for yourself. Because a lake doesn't go anywhere. But a river moves. A river flows. It gives away. It gives out. And I'm not saying you need to run out of here and have some kind of great message. I'm saying go out of here, carry the Spirit of God, believing that you are a carrier of His presence, and enjoy Him. He is the greatest adventure that you will ever sign up for. There is no show that you could desire to be on that would be better. There is nothing greater than coming into partnership with the living God and giving Him your best. Something we're speaking about the power of surrender and the prayer and it's just sometimes we just need to stop and just reason. Just like, oh God, I've, I've been trying this for such a long time and I keep bringing myself into it. But I actually just need to lay it all down again and just say, Jesus, would you please? Would you please just be everything that you call me to be in my life and through my life? And John 7, verse 37 to 38, he says, if anyone is thirsty, then he comes to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, the scriptures have said, streams of living water will flow from the him. And by this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believe in him will later receive. We are those who later receive, we receive. If you are a believer in Jesus, if you have given him your yes, he has given you his Spirit. You don't need to question it, you don't need to doubt it, you don't need to spend too much time worrying about it, you just need to get to know him. You need to live with him. And if you are afraid, there's another beautiful saying it's that secrecy is the enemy to intimacy. Do me a favor. Just take a moment to realize that he is the all-knowing, all-powerful God. There is nothing, and I mean nothing in your life that he's not aware of. You could be sitting here having thoughts like kind of all going crazy, and he's aware of it. And he doesn't run from you, he runs to you. I will end with this, that the, the Jewish people, they don't refer to the parable of the prodigal son as the prodigal son, they refer to it as the running father. Because it's not about the boys, yeah. it's about the heart of the father towards his son. And if we would just change our posture to receive of his goodness, if we would change our posture to realize that there is nothing that I have said or done that can keep me from His goodness, there is nothing that I can attain in my own ability, but that when I open up my eyes and I see that my Father comes running with joy, with excitement, that He loves to love you, that He loves. The first time I heard somebody say that, that God loves, I was like, what? But then she says it in his arms. That he laughs. And I heard somebody else saying, Would Jesus not laugh when he knows that he's going to overthrow all the people? Can you imagine his confidence knowing that he has done it all? Can you imagine knowing that as a young child, when he's about 12, ministering in the synagogues, that come 33, oh boy, guys, if you only know what's coming in 20 years' time, these things you're trying to figure out, I'm just going to do it all. How much more should we not be full of the Holy Spirit? Know that we walk as conquerors, that we walk as those who are overcomers, not because we're great, but because God is good and He is present. So, how do you stand with me? Put in praise and pray and praise and song. Father, I want to speak to every heart in this room this morning. I always speak to anybody who is filled with dry bones and an inability to move because they're stuck in their past. I always speak to every callous part of every blind eye and every dead ear to awaken the Jesus name. 
I thank you, Jesus, that you are in this room, that you are not moved by feeling, that you are moved by truth. And the truth is that when the sun sets free, it's free indeed. And there was freedom in this room at this morning. There was freedom available to us here this morning. There is freedom to drink of his goodness. There is freedom here to, to eat where you feel the hunger that you need. You don't need to go digging, you just need to open your mouth and receive. So Holy Spirit, I pray a blessing over this house this morning. I pray God that the hearts will be awakened to your goodness and to your power and to your presence. I pray, Father, that there will be intimidation and inferiority that will come knocking at our door, that we would remind him of who he is, defeated, and who we are, called and anointed in Jesus' name.